Welcome to the Muse Writer Center and this live event, this special live event, lecture, free lecture, and free um, Q&A. We are so happy to, uh, to have uh, Jane here tonight um, to, to uh, give us a lecture and, and spend some time with us. Um, one of our students actually is related to her through marriage, I believe, and, and came up with the idea and we were able to make it happen really quick. And uh, she's a very well known, been on the New York Times bestseller f uh, 50 times or more, um, a great writer and, and also just a phenomenal speaker from uh, what I hear. And I'm really looking forward to hearing her talk and, and, and hearing all your questions and just celebrating um, writing in general and, and becoming a writing. She, I hear that she's very good at answering questions. So I know we have a lot of uh, future writers, current writers, wannabe writers, or just readers that want to ask questions. And this is a great night to do it. If you are watching this live on Facebook, uh, make sure you put a, a question in the comment below and I will do my best to get to it. There's already a couple people in the room. I ask that everyone in the room remains muted until um, Jane calls on you. And uh, also, I would, uh, uh, you know, and, and then we'll go back and forth and ask questions, and you can ask a question and answer. But just make sure that when, every, when someone else is talking that you're muted. Um, well, let me first start out by just telling you a little bit about the Muse Writer Center. If you don't know who we are, we're one of the largest literary centers in the country. Uh, we offer lots of classes, seminars, workshops for all ages, for all genres, for all levels of writers. Um, and we also offer unlimited tuition assistance to those who need it. All you have to do is ask. Uh, we gave away almost $30,000 in tuition assistance last year because we don't want anything to get in the way of people learning how to write and sharing their experiences through the written word. So all you have to do is ask. We actually have a brand new fall schedule all online. It's on the-muse.org. You go to the online class page and you just see so many great classes available. One of them coming up um, in two weeks by an amazing fiction writer, uh, Desiree Cooper, has a turbo narratives in a flash class, or um, turbo narratives class. She does write some flash fiction. Um, and there's seats available in that. We have uh, writers like Brad Parks is teaching a one-off seminar, Denty W. Moore. We also have a lot of uh, awesome some uh, two unbelievable fiction uh, studios for those advanced writers out there taught by um, Michelle Youngstone, who is a fabulous writer um, from uh, down in North Carolina. So we're really excited about that. But there's so many things for any any level of writer or people that just were curious about it. So please check us out, the dash muse. Dot org. Okay, that's all I'm going to talk about right now. We also have events, more events. Check us out. But I want to go ahead and turn the mic over to Jane and thank her very much for joining us this evening. Jane Krentz, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Okay, I think we're live. Yeah, all that good stuff. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> thank you so much for taking time tonight. Um, there's about 20 minutes of prepared speech here. So if you feel you need to get a beer, perhaps a glass of wine, totally understand. I'm not even going to notice. So don't worry about it. Uh, and then we'll get to the Q&A, which is when all the fun stuff happens. The title of the speech is Popular Fiction, Why It's Important, and No, It's Not Just Because It's Entertaining. I have some theories on that, but I should tell you how I got there, right? Let's say it started this way. I used to be a paranoid romance writer. This is because every Valentine's Day, the media would call, the publicist would call, someone wanted an interview and the interview was always about 10 things you can do to spice up your love life. Well, I'm sorry, I don't have 10 things I can offer you, uh, but the media never called any other time of the year. So that was kind of why I got paranoid. Um, I am proud to say that I am no longer a paranoid romance writer. I am now a paranoid writer of popular fiction. And I got there because I had a few epiphanies a while back and like everyone else who's ever had an epiphany, I can't wait to share mine with you. The first one happened, notes. The first one happened when I was standing in a bookstore back when we had a lot of bookstores around and I was up browsing through the mystery section and there were two other people there looking at the new hardcover mysteries. And one of them said to the other, 
Well, I read these once in a while, you know, when I haven't got a book from my book club that I'm, that I should be reading or the other one said, I do too. Sometimes I just haven't got the energy, you know, to read something heavier and then I'll go for, I'll go for a mystery. They stood there for a while, but in the end, neither one of them had the courage to buy a mystery in front of the other. They didn't want the other person to think that they actually took mysteries that seriously. That was a conversation that changed my life, i.e. it's not just romance that everybody's down on, I guess you would say. The second epiphany occurred when I was standing with a group of writers at a book fair here in Seattle. And if you know Seattle, um, you know, we have a lot of writers up here. This has become writer city. I'm not quite sure why, but we're here. So we have book fairs and that's where we meet each other and get together and stuff. So I'm standing in a, in a, gr in a group that included some local well-known horror writers, thriller writers, mystery writers, et cetera, et cetera. And we all got a glass of wine, which is kind of typical of writers groups. There's nobody actually who does whining better than writers. We're exceedingly, exceedingly talented at it. So after we started, started enjoying the glasses of wine, the stories came out. And every one of those writers from all these popular fiction genres and every single one of them a successful writer had the same horror stories to tell, right? These are the stories of the person who comes through the autograph line, buys the book, and then announces in a voice that pitched all the way to the end of the line, I don't read these books. I'm buying this for my elderly Aunt Mabel. The next, the, the next horror story that you always hear is you tell your friends, your parents, your colleagues, your academic friends, academic colleagues, and you tell them you just published a book and they say, well, that's nice. When are you gonna write a real book? These popular fiction and romance in particular has achieved all of what we would call the mainstream, right? The books are romance, for example, is published like everything else in hardcover. It, come, it shows up in public libraries. Uh, and by the way, don't ever forget the importance of the public library. If your book is in the public library, it is, in our culture, it is somehow a real book. More importantly, romance and the others show up on all the bestseller lists. Uh, the New York Times, the um, USA Today, uh, Washington Post, um, Publishers Weekly. It doesn't get any more mainstream. No, not everyone likes romance and some people feel free to disparage it to my face, I might add. And I can't tell you how many times people have said, what do you write? I say romantic suspense, and they say, oh, I don't read anything romantic. Okay, fine. It goes on from there because at that point, I began to realize this, this is not just a prejudice against romance. I think the prejudice against romance has, is a particularly sharp extension of our culture's overall prejudice against the whole of popular fiction. Um, that prejudice actually starts out, I think, in a lot of ways from, it derives from the 20th century. Now, it wasn't like there, people have not been trying to kill off romance and popular fiction in general for about 300 years. But in the 19th century, people started really getting agitated about it, primarily because so many women were reading novels. Not good for the brain, no, novels, especially Gothic novels. And everybody loved Gothic novels. As we moved into the 20th century, looking back, it's obvious that 20th century fiction that was identified as literary was being heavily influenced by existential philosophy, the latest thinking in the social sciences, um, the psychological theories that were coming out all of that began to seep into literary fiction. And that fiction that explored those became what we call today literary, I think. It insists that good writing should adhere to a cold style of writing that 
abhors descriptive language, language of sentiment, and strong emotions on the page. But most of the all creative lighting, creative writing classes that I have heard about and have attended often try to avoid the heroic traditions and the archetypes of that have always defined the genres of popular fiction. This prejudice, I think, starts at the academy and it's trickled down as things tend to do from the academy into the media. I have a clear memory of a national best-selling business journal a few years ago that profiled a lot of very successful popular fiction writers. And the tone of the piece was just as snarky about the thriller writers, the horror writers, as it was about the romance writers and all the others. It was basically, look how much money these people are making writing trash. The criticism of popular fiction romance in particular has a long and extremely lurid history, which I will not bore you with here. Suffice it to say that, as I said, critics have been trying to kill it off for about 300 years. The anti, um, the, I think the most, the criticism of popular fiction takes the traditional view, I think really based on the fact that anything that's popular can't be good. But all the genres and the subgenres of popular fiction thrive in spite of all the bad press. This is extremely fortuitous for the folks who make careers out of criticizing it. Literary critics who don't understand the true significance of popular fiction face the same problematic future as dogs that like to ch chase cars. It's a great hobby until you catch one. Because in a one-on-one -on -one contest between cars and dogs, it's the car that wins every time. And I can assure you that in the eternal contest between critics and popular fiction, popular fiction wins every time. It has been around forever, but rarely has it been viewed as important in and of itself. Rarely have we acknowledged that it has a crucial place in culture. We rarely have we come to terms with the fact that popular fiction is not simply a degraded form of literary fiction. And it's to be meant only for light entertainment, not to be taken seriously. The truth is popular fiction, mystery, science fiction, sword and sorcery, fantasy, glitz, romance, historical, saga, horror, thrillers, techno thrillers, legal thrillers, medical thrillers. Popular fiction is its own thing. It stands on its own. It draws its power from the ancient heroic traditions of storytelling, not modern angst. And it is important, even if it is entertaining. It has its own tasks. And I would argue that those tasks are separate from and different from the tasks of literary fiction. It is wrong to use the standards of one to judge the other. Every genre of fiction, popular or literary, is defined not by its backgrounds, its settings, or the social and psychological issues that are dealt with in the story, but by the fundamental focus of those stories. The one driving storytelling element that you could not remove and still have a book left that would appeal to readers of that genre. In a mystery, there must be a mystery to be solved. No matter how convoluted the plot, no matter how much psychodrama in the tale, no matter how alienated or dysfunctional the protagonist, a successful mystery story must solve the crime. Justice must be done to maintain the all important illusion of order and balance in the universe. Fantasy, horror, and apocalyptic novels that fail to pit good against evil in larger than life terms are pretty much guaranteed to sink like a stone in the marketplace. Science fiction that fails to deal with the ultimate challenge of confronting the unknown will crash and burn. The romance novel that fails to bring about a positive resolution to the conflicts and problems inherent in the formation of a strong bond between two people who then use that bond to forge a family unit will not survive in the market. A romance novel that ends with a hero and heroine going their separate ways or ending might be an excellent book in some other genre, but it will not be a romance novel. It can be done, but it will be a different book when it's finished. Same with all the other genres, same with mystery and the others. My friend Anne Maxwell, who um, 
writes as Elizabeth Lowell, has observed that genres can be understood by an examination, not just of what is allowed into them, but perhaps more significantly by what is not allowed into them. The modern literary genre, and yes, literary fiction is a genre. It has its own subgenres. What's more, I can prove this easily enough. You know it when you see it. It even has its own cover art. Has different rules and conventions. Much of what is not acceptable in the literary genre, the heroic, the mythic, the romantic, the larger than life elements, the character who uses the classic heroic virtues to overcome his or her own flaws long enough to do what must be done. These are precisely the elements that lie at the heart of popular fiction. Concepts like honor matter in popular fiction. Courage matters. Determination matters. The possibility of redemption matters. These are ancient heroic virtues. They do not derive from modern psychological theory or contemporary sociological thought. What's more, they are infused with enormous survival value for individuals, families, and communities. The literary genre, on the other hand, tends to focus on intimate examinations of characters who are victims, either either of their own flaws or their dysfunctional childhoods. It dissects and explores in often painful detail, neurosis, psychosis, obsessions, depression, addictions, and the negative impact of dysfunctional families. Popular fiction gets involved in this stuff too, of course. You've got your classic hard-boiled private eye who sucks at relationships and is fighting a never-ending battle of alcoholism, a tradition that goes back to Sherlock Holmes and his famous flirtation with cocaine. You've got your traditional half-human, half-alien, or half-monster science fiction or horror character who must struggle with a part of himself that does not fit in with the crowd. Think Frankenstein's monster and Bram Stoker's Dracula. Then there's the tough Western gunslinger or the modern former force, former special forces agent. That's hard to say. Who also sucks at relationships and is suffering from PTSD because he saw too much of violence and gore, but who must take up his guns again to save the innocent and maybe save the world. There is the decent character of shaky or non-existent religious faith who suddenly finds himself or herself facing real evil and the possibility of genuine good. There is the classic character whose dysfunctional childhood makes it difficult to take a commit, make a commitment and take the risk of falling in love. And so it goes, generation after generation of flawed, emotionally vulnerable heroes and heroines who are the heart and soul of both popular and literary fiction. But the difference is that in popular fiction, these characters must triumph at least long enough to do the right thing. They must find a positive resolution to their problems. When the chips are down, they must come through. They must save the day. They must do the right thing, even if it means sacrificing everything, their life, their happiness. It, the hero does what he has to do, and so does the heroine. Hey, we all know what a hero and a heroine is supposed to do, right? From Nancy Drew to Robert Parker Spencer to Clive Cussler's Dirk Pitt, Christina Dodds, Kellen Adams, Greg Hurwitz's Orphan X, we know what a hero is supposed to do when the chips are down. The mystery must get solved, justice must be done, good must win the battle with evil, and redemption is possible. Now, the latest thinking in evolutionary biology holds that when something flourishes and survives, in spite of unrelenting efforts to kill it off, we have to ask one simple question, why? And no, entertainment is not a sufficient justification. That is just too superficial. There are, after all, many ways humans can entertain themselves. I think it's clear that popular fiction survives and thrives precisely because it affirms our most important core values, values that are crucial to the survival of our culture. Literary fiction, on the other hand, 
does not concern itself with seeking positive resolutions to problems. It does not usually take that as its task. The job of modern literary fiction is to illuminate and examine those things, not to resolve or to affirm the triumph over them. This is the primary reason, of course, why it's so hard to have a happy ending in, in literary fiction. Well, that and the fact that the characters never seem to learn from their own mistakes, but that's a whole other issue. In the course of our lives, we all need both kinds of fiction, popular and literary. But most of us, readers and writers alike, tend to develop a preference for one over the other. And our chase choices say more about our own personal philosophies, our worldviews, our sense of optimism and hope, and our belief in the future than they do about either our intelligence or our education. We are attracted to a particular type of fiction, popular or literary, because something in it affirms our core values and our most fundamental deeply held convictions and worldviews. There is nothing wrong with either popular or literary fiction, but as a rule, they have different goals. If you would truly appreciate popular fiction, not just as entertainment, you must understand its unique tasks. Literary critics often criticize popular fiction because it's not quote unquote realistic, but that is a ludicrous criticism, which completely misses the point. It is not the task of popular fiction to be realistic. It may feel realistic on occasion. The settings or emotions and the psychological motivations of the characters may feel very real. And the best writers are good at invoking that feeling of realism, but it is not the same as being real. I'd like to mention that this critical emphasis on the importance of realism is a rather new phenomenon in the arts. And you will note that critics usually apply it only to books. Realism is certainly not considered an important asset in the visual arts, such as paintings, sculpture, or as anyone who has ever posed for the back cover of her book can tell you, photography. Nor is it considered important in the other arts, such as film, opera, theater, or dance just books. The point is all fiction is based on fantasy. That's why it's called fiction. And just as the average reader of Lee Child's Jack Reacher series does not finish a book, pack his bags and head out on the road to beat up bad guys, the average romance reader does not confuse fantasy and reality either. Readers of popular fiction are experienced readers in every sense of the word. They understand intuitively how fiction works. Another criticism of popular fiction is that the stories are deemed to be similar, even repetitious in terms of theme and plot and characters. It's true that familiar fantasy worlds, worlds that can be re-entered again and again, are the mainstay of a great deal of popular fiction. Readers may love it, but I can tell you on the side that a lot of long running series is considered both a blessing and a curse by a lot of successful writers. Why do you think Conan Doyle tried to Kill off Sherlock Holmes. The truth is most people, oh, sorry, phone, not phone, door knock. The truth is when people read popular fiction, they read along narrow lines. So narrow, in fact, that well-established genres usually have dozens of subgenres, each with, it, or each with its own kind of landscape. Fans of hard-boiled American private eye novels, for example, often won't read what are termed cozies. Those are those clever, intimate, small town stories and quirky characters and a sleuth who does not come out of traditional law enforcement. Readers of cozies, on the other hand, often have no interest in reading police procedurals, which are in turn broken down into American style police procedurals and British style police procedural. Fans of one of the procedurals, one type of procedurals usually won't touch the other. And by the way, here's a tip for telling the difference between American and British police procedurals. In the British version, the cops are usually the good guys. That dirty cop story has long been an American story. The stories in popular fiction offer warnings about wrong choices and support the heroic ideal of doing the right thing regardless of personal cost. They are morality plays. They have a strong moral compass. They offer hope for the future. They give us a sense of transcendence. 
by illustrating the ancient heroic qualities, of honor, courage, determination, and a belief in the healing power of love. They remind us that we can and should use these qualities to overcome our very human flaws and weaknesses. They teach us that we need not be victims of those flaws and weaknesses. Being a victim has no survival value. The courage to overcome one's victimhood, on the other hand, has enormous survival value. Popular fiction keeps alive the goal of overcoming the past and the belief that the future can be changed for the better. As a writer, I see the genres as a circle of deep well springs, which together feel, uh, fill a vast pool. The pool itself is the whole of fiction, popular and literary. Many things disturb the surface waters of this great pool. Contemporary trends and problems, social sciences, new theories of psychology, and the ever-changing tide of history. These disturbances create ripples which spread out across the great pool, but they do not sink deep. They do not affect the great rushing waters of the wellsprings at the bottom of the pool. These ripples do, however, serve to refresh, renew, and reinterpret the power of the genres for readers and writers alike on a regular basis. They craft the story and retell it in modern contemporary terms. But the heroes and heroines who flourish are still those who have heart. The characters who learn from their mistakes, those who dig deep and use the ancient heroic virtues to do the right thing, even if it costs everything. The ripples on the surface of the great pool of fiction come and go, but at their heart, the genres do not change very much because the ancient heroic traditions and archetypes that give them their power do not change. And in the modern world where everything is routinely explained in terms of dysfunctional families, psychological disorders, and sociological problems, readers come to popular fiction for stories that celebrate the ancient heroic virtues, the larger than life characters, and a belief in the healing power of love. Okay, that is the formal part of the talk. And we are now ready to go to questions if I can figure out how to do this. Please. Please mute if your microphone's, <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. So if you have questions, please post. I will try and catch them. And are we live again? Everybody's, I can hear everybody now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Feel free to enter. I have no idea what I'm doing here. I'm just kind of moving through here. Um, if nobody has any questions, I'm happy to talk about other things like my if you're an aspiring writer, I think tips for an aspiring writer, I think one of the first things I would learn, want you to do is figure out your core story. And everybody's got one, trust me. I think I could start out with the question and get the ball rolling. <clears throat> if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> actually, let me oh, let's see, make sure. Okay, now we're all uh, together. <laughs> so my question is, is that looking at, I really enjoyed your, uh, your lecture, by the way, I think it's very interesting. And I think I like the idea of having these discussions, especially at the Muse. This is what we're about. People enjoy so many different kinds of stories. And I really do agree with you that it does kind of have to do with their view of life and their, the way that they, what they enjoy. Um, but I have also, I've been kind of in this thing where I used to be very much a, a literary snob, I think. And I would think literature, literary fiction was the real deal, popular fiction wasn't, even in so much of film. Uh, when I was a filmmaker younger, I would think that too. But then as I grew older and learned more about life, I started looking for that happy ending more and understanding how great the craft was and things like that. And I've started to see the necessity of both as a reader. So my question is, though, is the happy ending is, is that I tend to find that looking for the happy ending that a lot of people also have a different way of what they consider a happy ending to be. And I was just wondering what your thoughts on that would be, because I've read some literary fiction pieces that had this happy ending, but all throughout the whole book, one is an example, it's called the uh, Brothers K. Throughout the whole book, it's just like this gut-wrenching, unbelievably literary fictional story. And, and at the end, it has this 
as happy of ending as it could have had in a way where it really was kind of a sappy ending. And I just uh, thought that that was such a unique thing that filled me with so much joy. So maybe it is something that is a rarer, but I just wonder what you think about that concept of the fact of how happy endings might be considered, might be different for other people. And there's different kinds of happy endings, you know? I think that the ending has to be is satisfying. You have to have a sense that that the core problem was resolved one way or another, even if the hero dies. You know what I mean? It's 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 more a sense of whether or not the happy ending is a satis satisfies. And the problem with tacking it on to a book that was written in a whole other way, I think would give you a a, a sense of distortion that might not work tell you the truth but i don't know um i haven't tried to do it <laughs> i'm not sure how if it can be done um i do tend to write lighter myself i'm more of, i'm not a comic writer but i am a more light-hearted writer so i am easier with doing the happy endings it's easy for me and feels natural to me Okay, I have a question um, from the uh, Facebook community here, and I'm just going to read it rather than attempt to uh, um, text you. It is from Kathy Barnstorff. I enjoy the paranormal aspects of many of your novels. How do you come up with the with some of those concepts? Yeah, if, if you read me a lot, you probably know that I'm constantly flirting with the paranormal. I do draw a distinction between my kind of paranormal and the supernatural. Within within the paranormal genre, they're two different. They're they get fused a lot, but they're two different things. And the supernatural would be vampires, werewolves, um, witches, that kind of thing. I prefer the paranormal as a natural extension of to intuition, an extension of our um, our natural senses, and that's the way I use it. So I guess the answer to the question is: I get there, I get there, and use it. Because I, in my mind, it's just one step beyond what most people think of as intuition, and everybody seems to think they have intuition. So that's how I use the paranormal. And here's a great big hug. Um, oh, <laughs> sorry, sorry, Carolyn. It's a great big, huge fan of the happy ending. Thanks. <laughs> well, hugs to you too, waving from Seattle. <laughs> And it's a, um, and a fan of mine. Thank you very much. I find your dialogue to be fun and the part I love to read and reread. Any tips on how to write dialogue? Yes, read it aloud. The thing about dialogue and narrative is that when you, when you write, most writers tend to head in one direction or the other instinctively. They either prefer to tell the story with, with words, you know, and, and describe descriptions and narrative or they tell the story with dialogue. So you have to figure out which one you are, you are first. If your instinct is to go to narrative, you're gonna to need to work on dialogue. If your instinct is to shoot for dialogue, you need to work on narrative. And I know all about this because I'm really poor at description. I get very bored with it in a hurry. I just wanna get back to the chatter, the conversation, because for me, the stories unfold in the dialogue. That's when I know what my, my characters constantly surprise me and that's where it's going to happen is in that dialogue. Having said that, as I said, you've got to have both. So um, I, one, one of the only technique I can think of in terms of writing it is to read it aloud and see if it flows like you would in a conversation. That's about the only one I can think of that comes to mind right now. Any other questions? Here we go from Vicki. We live in such a sensitive society today. Uh, do books go to sensitivity readers during the editorial process? Um, good question. The, the sensitivity readings are new to the industry and it, they are happening. Um, I haven't actually run afoul of anybody yet, but um, it could happen. Uh, the publishers are really trying to do the right thing, I think, and they don't want to offend. And, so a lot of books are going to be read by this second reader, a sensitivity reader. And it's probably a good idea, not because you're gonna to have to accept their verdict. You're still the author, what you say will go, 
but it will give you an, if you've been tone deaf on some subject, it might give you a, a chance to think about whether you really want to do it that way. As I said, I haven't personally had a problem with it. Um, but yes, the sensitivity reading is happening and throughout publishing. Um, anything else? Well, and that actually brings up the whole thing about self-publishing because if, if, you know, that's not going to be a factor with self-publishing. Follow on to that. Are there topics you won't discuss in your books? Absolutely. But mostly because I don't want to get mired in current politics or, um, I, and I don't want to anchor the books in a piece, in a period of time. I want the books to feel as timeless as possible because here's what I've learned after 30 years. 30 years from now, if I'm still alive, people are still gonna be picking up the books I'm writing today. And if I'm using politics that sets a time and a place or if I'm using a pandemic, for example, or something else equally specific to a time and place, I've suddenly dropped the book back into a historical fiction. And I'd rather my books were had a contemporary feel. And I, and I will say that <laughs> one of the biggest problems that hit writers like me in the past couple of decades was the invention of the cell phone. <laughs> if you go back to any of my eager book, my earlier books, everybody's everybody's got a cord phone. You know? <laughs> have to plug the phone in. Um, cell phones have really complicated mystery writers' lives, I will tell you that. Let's see, we got, um, oh, I really enjoyed your talk. I wish I had taken notes. You have really gotten to the heart of why I enjoy popular fiction. It helps me hope for the future. It's because it's confirming some really ancient values. And in doing so, it gives us a sense of transcendence. We are not just victims of the 21st century. Um, I like superhero movies for the same reason. They're, they're our modern form of, of myths. No question about it. Oh, from Facebook, Cindy. Cindy with a Y, two Ys. Are you a plotter or a pantser? <laughs> All right, and has this changed over your years? For if you haven't heard this term, plotting or pantsing is simply whether or not you do a detailed outline ahead of time of your story and you know where you're going from day one when you sit down, or if you start with an idea and then just kind of let the story happen. It's it's a bit of both. I have a story idea that I know I'm gonna be working with and I know I'm gonna be working with two characters who are gonna fall in love. So I've got, it, I start asking questions. I, I think that's how I get through a book. I wish I were one of those writers who could do the plot ahead of time. It would be, it would be so much more relaxing. I wouldn't have to get up every morning and have a lot of sleepless nights worrying about what, what was gonna happen next, right? That's the virtue of doing it with an outline and doing that ahead of time. My problem with elaborate outlining is that it feels like I've told the story and I kind of lose interest in it. Um, so I write in a, in a nerve wracking way. I'm, I, I give anything to change it, but I can't fix it because I won't get my really good ideas until I actually start writing. That's the problem for me. If I could get all my good ideas up front, that would be one thing. But I think the very act of writing for me, the very creative process itself makes me more creative. If you see what I mean, I get my best ideas halfway through the book. That's all I can tell you. Um, hi Jane, I remember you saying you have a library background. Yes. Are you a professor too? Nope. <laughs> Thanks. I, she went on to, goes on to say, Lorraine goes on to say she loves my presentation. Thank you. No, um, I am a former librarian, as everybody who's been a librarian knows, there are no ex-librarians. We're kind of like the brains that way. You never actually leave the service. Um, and I took those skills, th those skills turned out to be incredibly useful because of course, one of the basic things you learn in, in library school is how to tell good sources from bad sources, <laughs> how to how to judge sources, uh, how to tell the difference between original sources and secondary sources and, you know, all that, all that kind of good stuff and how to track down information. So, so that turned out to be very useful in the research end of writing, which sooner or later everybody needs because after you've written your first book, you will have written everything you know, and then you're going to have to do it again. 
Um, let's see. This is a great point about dating the book with pop references. Yeah, it's, it can be an issue. Um, I'll warn you right now. You start naming rock bands or presidents or anything else that ties it to a year and a date. Um, I mean, the alternative to that is to say that I am writing a book set in 1986. Uh, you know, right now, for example, I am not writing in the pandemic story because by the time the book gets published, hopefully, will be past it or still in it. But either way, five years from now, it won't be, it'll be identified with this time and place. And I don't want the book to be identified with that time and place if I can avoid it. And your typical writing day, would you please describe it? <laughs> well, I'm an early riser, so there's that. Um, I think you'll find yourself either more of a night writer or a day writer. It's kind of goes with the territory. I am, um, you know, I, we get up at 5.30. What can I tell you? So, <laughs> so I'm at the computer by seven. Most of my creative writing will happen well before noon. By noon, I will probably be, I won't say exhausted, but I will have written probably the most creative part of whatever I'm going to do that day. And then after lunch, I go back, I look at it, I reread, um, I worry about what I'm going to write tomorrow. I try to, I do some research. I do a lot of research on the fly after I have done a basic overview. This happens especially when I'm doing the 1930s. My Amanda, I should back up and say, for those of you who don't me, I have don't know me, I have three names. Okay, um, Jane Ann Krentz, which is I'm here tonight. This is me, is my married name. Um, Jane Castle happens to be my birth name, and I now use it for my futuristic stories. And Amanda Quick is the name I use for my historicals. And what I was going to say is Amanda Quick um, books are now set in the 1930s. So for that, what I, what I approached it, I approached it by doing a general overview of the time period. And then I sat down to write after I had my, I, I needed a plot point. And I decided, I think the first book I decided, um, you know, I can't remember how I, how I figured it out. <laughs> Mike Krentz, my uh, cousin by marriage who is with us tonight, was actually <laughs> very helpful in plotting the book because it involves some military hardware, which was all about radar. It was all about radar. Let's just, the secret of the story was about radar. And I will just say as a, an aside, do you have any idea how hard it is to write about radar when the word had not yet been coined? Think, things you don't expect. <laughs> hey, Mike, are you there? I'm going to try unmuting you. Are you there? Ah. There we go. Hi, ah. how you doing? Good, waving, nice waving from the East Coast to the West Coast. Yeah, congratulations on, on Dead Already coming out in a, what, next yeah. month, November? November 27th, Black Friday. Not that you're counting. <laughs> right, exactly. So, so I have a question, actually. First of all, thanks for doing this. But uh, uh, this is, I'm going to, I already know the answer, I think. How long did it take from when you decided to become a writer to when you published your first book? It was six long years. Um, but remember, at the time, there was no alternative. There were no ebooks. There was no self-public. So six years, <laughs> sadly. I, you learn a lot. I mean, after, but at the time, I only had to do three chapters in a proposal. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, so I just wrote, a whole ton of three chapters in a proposal until something finally hit. But what really, what really helped at that point was the whole market for romantic suspense opened up in the U.S. It had been a pretty closed market for American writers for decades, and in the 1980s it opened up. And I was standing on the right corner when the streetcar went by. Um, Okay, let's see, anything else here? Have you ever immersed yourself so much in a work of fiction, your own or someone else's, that you forget it's not real? I have caught myself almost believing in dust bunnies <laughs> from Harmony. That's, okay, for those of you who don't know me, I write the Harmony books as Jane Castle, and yes, they are dust bunnies. And um, there are dust bunnies and they're little animals in the stories. Yeah books frankly that's kind of what I've done to myself I have this and the people who read the harmony books 
they don't care about my clever plots. They don't care about my brilliant characterizations and my descriptions and my world building. All they want are more dust bunnies. So I believe in them now too, because I've like taken over my entire Jane Castle life. Um, let's see, not a question, a confession. This is from Mary. I, re I read too, so many of your Amanda Quick books that when I submitted my book to an RWA contest, the judge said, I sound like Amanda Quick. You got a score of 4.5 out of five. <laughs> that figures. I will tell you right now, I've never entered contests because there's enough, enough rejection in this business as it is. So it sounds, thank you for that report. I'm glad we passed. Um, anybody else here? We are getting quite a few, uh, a few. sorry, okay. um, requests that are uh, not necessarily questions, but just fans of you. A lot of I love dust bunnies and I love you. Thank you so much for this lecture. So people are really enjoying it for sure. Oh. Um, here's one that says, uh, my past writing has been in literary fiction. I really want to jump, jump, jump genres that's hard to say <laughs> and write mainstream okay yeah I, I understand completely and i think a lot of new writers especially if they've just taken a lot of literary um, writing classes creative writing classes and such or grew up on on or came out of or fresh out of school and have ideas about what constitutes literature would like to make the jump and it can be awkward so what I would encourage you to think of is don't be afraid of the archetypes. Popular fiction. Oh. <laughs> so much for turning a phone off. Ah, magic silencer here. All right, sorry about that. I thought I had turned it off. I apologize. Um, but, but in making the genre, uh, making the jump to the popular fiction genres, I would say just keep in mind that this is where you do want larger than life. This is where you want over the top. This is where you want strong emotions. This is where you want the heroic archetypes. Don't be afraid of them, they are your friend. And you will find yourself gravitating probably toward the kind of books you yourself like to read. And if you are a fan of thrillers or a fan of romance or a fan of, of fantasy, glitz, all the other popular fiction, I'd say start there because that's, you already have an intuitive feel for that popular fiction genre. And that's probably where you found your most satisfying archetypes for you and the most satisfying um, heroic elements. So that would be my advice. Good luck. It can be done. Um, I do enjoy a good, strong woman character and find you do that really well. And unapologetic, um, sorry, unapologetically. Did you ever get criticisms from editors or others that your women were too strong? Nope, never. Nope, not a problem. Stronger the better. Everybody likes, everybody who reads romance loves strong women characters. They like strong men too. One of, one of the nice things about the romance genre is that it's always been a genre that because it was so low on the, on the literary pole, so to speak, in terms of respect, Nobody ever paid any attention to it. And the result is that there were no rules. So we were free to do things that I frankly don't think we could have done, those of us who wrote it and write it. I don't think we would have been allowed to do the things that we do if we had written in other genres because there are conventions and people would have, um, people would have said there's rules. And the romance genres never really had much in the way of rules to speak of. So that's that's been a godsend. Interesting, a lot of popular fiction uh, writers, especially thriller writers that are very successful thriller writers and uh, today came out of, came out of romance. Uh, Sandra Brown, Iris Johansson, Tess Gerritsen, um, the list is, is quite long and, and they all came out of romance. And I'm convinced that the reason they are doing so well is because they, they kept that, their romantic sensibilities when they moved into thrillers and mysteries. Ah, here we got, um, trust me, that's in one of my books. That's why she's saying that. This is from Linda. 
trust me, one of my favorites. You had the hero get the heroine, a very early version of a smartphone. <laughs> yeah, I think they were called PDAs back in those days. And now the, the PDA is now a whole different meaning, but back in those days. Um, and that was because my husband is an engineer and he, he was cutting edge on that kind of stuff. He was always on top of that. Um, where did you get your notion of technology in this book? Blame it on Frank, that's my husband. My husband, the engineer. I use him for a lot of research. Um, anything else? Anything on your end, Sean? Yes, I have a question. Um, I think uh, from uh, Facebook here it says, in tr uh, uh, I love all your books. Do you foresee a time when you would not want to write anymore? And please don't ever stop. But <laughs> that's the question. My, my goal is to is to go out at 105 over my computer. But <laughs> we'll see. Um, no, I think as long as, you know, the urge to write is kind of an addiction. And I guess what would happen is that that addiction or that obsession would have to that passion would have to go away for some reason. And it could. Uh, I know a lot of writers over the years who have retired and are happy in, a, happy in retirement. They don't even want to write. So I think, I think the answer is as long as you need to write, you will write. And if you can stop, you will stop. I think that's a good answer. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk for a second. If anyone has any one last question, that would be great. Um, I think because um, if anyone in the room has a question, I know there's a lot of people that don't have their cameras on, but if you, you send it to the chat, which what people have been doing, we can still take a few more questions if you have them. Here's one right here from Bibby. Have you ever written yourself into a corner? If so, how do you recover your manuscript? <laughs> Oh, it happens all the time. Every, if you write, you're going to write yourself into a corner. And the other problem people will often ask about is um, how do you get out of writer's block, which is probably kind of close to the same thing. First of all, if you write into a corner, the, the quickest trick that you can try is to come at that scene from somebody else's point of view. You're in the wrong point of view. So you might try another character's point of view to write that scene, assuming you need that scene. That can be very helpful. And it also makes you, clicks your mind into a different track too, which can be very helpful. Um, the thing about writer's block is, I think what happens is people make too many rules for themselves. They, they feel like they need to do something different than they did the last time. Maybe they're, I, I, we call it second book-itis or third book-itis, which is you did it right. You don't know what you did right the first time. Now you're terrified of repeating yourself because nobody will respect your book because it'll look too much like the first one. Well, here's the thing. Your readers want it to look like the first one. You don't want the same story. They don't want the same characters necessarily, unless you're doing a continuing character. But they want the same emotional hit. And that's what you're after. So if, you're, if you tend to write comic, comedy and humor, pull out all the stops. If you tend to write drama, Pull out all the stops. Do not hold back. You want to go over the top. And um, I forget where I was going with that, but whatever I was doing, <laughs> that's my tip. <laughs> I guess I guess I'm saying that popular fiction is a place you do not want to uh, limit yourself. You're you're looking. What you do have to respect, and this is important to keep in mind, is there are conventions in every genre. Just as we discussed in the literary genre, there are conventions. And there are conventions, everybody who reads a certain genre expects certain elements to be in place, like solving the mystery. But if you read in that area already, you're gonna know that. You're gonna know what those conventions are intuitively. Nobody has to tell you. Um, Mike Prince says, someone earlier asked what Jane's core story and how does a writer find a core story? Oh, that would be my, my biggest tip to you, those of you. Do we have time, Sean? Yes, no? Okay. Uh, my biggest tip to you if you're starting out is you don't have to know your core story because you're going to write it intuitively, but it can be very useful to know it intellectually if and when you hit a brick wall in publishing. Because the thing about a core story is that it's not related to the fictional landscape. A lot of people think, oh, I got to write vampires. Vampire market is gone. It's dried up. What am I going to do? Or I got to write. Nobody's writing um, 
um, cozies right now, you know, whatever it is, the thing to remember is that your core story are the themes, the conflicts, the kinds of motivations and the emotional, the, mo the emotional thing, elements that you like to work with as an author. And here's the thing, you can take that anywhere just as you can take a good plot anywhere. There are only like a handful of plots, maybe four or five. I, you know, I'm, people argue over it, but the bottom line is there are only a handful of plots. So your job, you're gonna be hanging your story on one of those plots and you can pick the plot and you can pick the landscape, the fictional landscape and your core story can go anywhere. And knowing that is, can be very freeing if you find yourself with your career in the toilet, which I have done on, regular occasions. I have killed off, I've killed off a few names in my career, including at one point, my own birth name. <laughs> I think we have a good a question that's really deep. If you do you have time to answer one more question here from uh, Facebook? Brandy Lyons asks, I've just started writing short stories and some of my friends read one and t told me it was too descriptive and not descriptive enough. <laughs> How do you evaluate edits and suggestions and figure out who to listen to? Good question. And with all is said and done, you are going to have to go with your gut. And I would suggest the gut check is against what you know to be your core story. If you know your core story, don't drift too far from it and don't let somebody push you too far from it. Um, what, it isn't that you can't do it, it's that you'll lose your power as a writer. But having said that, um, you do have to decide if you need more narrative and description or if you're more driven by dialogue. If you see a, if you see a, a story unfold the way some, some of my friends will tell you this, they see it like a movie in their heads. Um, that's one, style, one way of, of doing it. Uh, for me, it's all verbal. I don't know why, it's just dialogue. Other people are, are just really love the words and they love the words for description and that's what they use. So you're gonna to have to temper that. Whatever direction you tend in, you need to develop the other skills. Um, does that answer the question, does that sound? I think so. I think it's a hard question to answer, but I, I do like the way you answer it. And I think the going with your gut, but always be ready for your gut to change too, probably. <laughs> and I think it's that's always something we deal with when we start getting a lot of feedback, I think. It's like, when do we stop listening to it? <laughs> yeah, and that, that's a very personal decision. and. If I'd stop listening if it sends you in a direction that you have no passion for. Yep. All right. I think that's great. I want to I want to thank you, Jane Ann Krentz, for joining us and having this wonderful lecture and discussion. It's really exciting. I hope it inspired a lot of people to keep writing, maybe start writing and uh, continue to tell the stories you want to tell.